Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows what the hearts conceal and what the tongues do not reveal. The one to whom all shall appeal, the one in front of whom the believers kneel. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his salat and his salam upon the one who was sent as rahmatan lil alameen, the one whom even his opponents used to call as sadiq an al and the one who will be our intercessor, Yawm uh, We're still doing our lessons on the detailed descriptions of the Day of Judgment from the Quran and from the Sunnah. And today, Alhamdulillah, we are now on our 10th episode, Alhamdulillah. And we are still uh, discussing uh, the very beginnings of the Day of Judgment. And I have covered the uh, coming out of the grave. We did a very long session about the Shafa'a and the fact that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam shall intercede on behalf of all of mankind so that the judgment begins. And in our last lesson, I had mentioned the evidences from the Quran and from, from the Quran and from the Sunnah regarding the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall himself come. Uh, the Quranic phrase is وَجَاءَ رَبُّكَ وَمَلَكُ صَفًّا صَفًّا or as in Surah Baqarah uh, هَلْ يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَأْتِيَهُمُ اللَّهِ Are they waiting? It's a rhetorical question. What else are they waiting for? Are they waiting for Allah Azza wa Jal himself to come فِي ظُلَلٍ مِنَ الْغَمَامِ وَالْمَلَائِكَةِ So Allah himself will come in the shadows of clouds and the angels themselves are going, are going to come. And of course, uh, in the other verse, And your Lord will come, and the angels will come in ranks and ranks upon one another. And uh, there are other evidences for this as well. And I had mentioned in our last lesson, I'm not going to go over all of that again, but that uh, just historically speaking, and I'm simply narrating history here, I'm not saying which one is right and wrong. Historically speaking, we have have had two interpretations even within our mainstream uh, Sunni schools about this understanding of Waja Rabbuk. And uh, my takeaway message from the last lesson was that let the advanced uh, students of knowledge and let the scholars who are experts in theology take their students and in their classes teach them the various evidences back and forth. But we should never create disharmony. We should never preach hatred. And I said very bluntly and frankly that in my opinion, uh, the uh, both of these schools have at times taken to extremes in their hatred of one another and in their claiming of deviation of the other group. And in all of this, they've lost the spirit of these verses. They've lost the whole point of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning these, even though I personally prefer uh, what is mentioned from the earliest of scholars. And there are so many books that have been written by Imam al-Darimi, by Imam al-Bukhari as well, by Imam al-Tabari, by uh, Ibn Khuzayma. So many early books have been written. But nonetheless, I cannot negate the fact that even in early Islam from around 300 Hijra or so, uh, another strand has given different interpretations and they are also a very respected strand with many, many famous respected scholars of Islam and they have the right to interpret the way that they have done and inshaAllah ta'ala both groups they want to uh, respect the Quran and they want to show respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we should look at the uh, intentions and not really get involved in uh, especially at a very uh, a, a basic level not get involved in sectarianism in this regard choose whichever of the two you want and of course we're going to continue down that's why I have to re reiterate from last week because in today's lesson and in future lessons, some of these other attributes are going to come and the same philosophy is going to apply where one strand of Islam very explicitly said, look, if Allah says it, then let's not really delve too deeply and accept it as is. And another strand said, well, it's not really quite what Allah meant. He meant something else and they have their interpretation. We're going to continue down this vein as well. And in today's lesson, we're going to begin with from where we left off last week. And that is that after the coming of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَجَاءَ رَبُّكَ What is the purpose of Allah Himself coming and the angels coming? What is the, the goal of that? That goal is what is now called the ard or the display. And uh, the fact that all of the creation, all of them, the Muslim and the Kafir, the Jinn and the Ins, all of them will be standing in front of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and Allah Azza wa Jal will 
uh, look upon or will gaze upon the creation. And this is something that is very explicit in the Quran and in the Sunnah. And we're going to go into some detail because again, I want uh, this class and these series of classes not just to be academic in nature that we memorize this, this, this going to happen. No, I want it to be where well, we need to visualize as much as we can. Imagine standing there so that we are prepared insha'Allah ta'ala for that day. And the Quran mentions uh, a number of different phrases that display uh, the notion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, looking upon the creation or to be more precise, the creation being displayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of the words that is used is the word uridha, uridha, wa uridu ala rabbik, uridha. And uridha, it is used in the passive tense because the active is arada. Uridha is the passive, which basically means they shall be displayed. So they meaning us. So they meaning the creation. So we shall be displayed because arada in arabic means to be to to be to be displayed and uridha is the passive tense so what the meaning here is that the angels will gather up mankind or that mankind themselves uh, will be gathered in a way that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how and Allah azza wa jal will then come and we shall be displayed in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the evidences for this are plenty of them. Three verses in the Quran in order of their uh, chronology. Surah uh, Hud, verse 18. Surah Hud, verse 18. وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنِ افْتَارَ عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا Who does more injustice than the one who lies against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? أُولَٰئِكَ يُعْرَضُونَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ These people, they shall be displayed in front of their Lord. وَيَقُولُ الْأَشْحَادِ And the witnesses will point out, هَٰؤُلَاءِ الَّذِينَ كَذَبُوا عَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ These are the people who lied about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَلَىٰ لَعْنَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَىٰ الظَّالِمِينَ Verily, Allah's la'na is upon those who have done injustice. And the height of injustice, the worst injustice, even worse than shirk from one sense, is to lie against Allah, to say about Allah something that Allah did not say. And so in this verse, we, we see that there shall be on the day of judgment, witnesses, i.e. the angels, who will be pinpointing groups of people. And when will that pinpointing happen? When all of mankind is standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the angels are going to point out, and uh, as Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ يُعْضُونَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ These people shall be displayed in front of Allah azza wa jal, along with all of the other people. And at that display, the, 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 the angels will then testify, these are the liars who have lied against Allah. In Surah Al-Kahf, verse 48, Allah says, وَعُرِضُوا عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ صَفَّا And they shall all be displayed in front of their Lord in rows and ranks. Imagine all of mankind, subhanAllah, when we look at gatherings that are done in these countries that have 10,000 soldiers or you know 10,000 people, we say, wow, how large this is. Can you imagine hundreds of millions? Can you imagine many, many billions of people all lined up in straight rows? All of mankind shall be gathered and presented in front of your Lord. All of them in rows. But even though we are in rows, subhanAllah, this is so powerful in the Quran. Even though you think we have, mashaAllah, billions and billions of people around us, no, we shall feel alone in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah says in the Quran, وَعُرِضُوا عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ صَفًّا لَقَدْ جِئْتُمُونَا كَمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً we, You have come to us like we created you the first time. And in the other verse we're going to come, لَقَدْ جِئْتُمُونَا فُرَادًا You have come to us one on one. So even though there will be millions and billions of people around us, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, the feeling will be we are all alone. We are standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah says, لَقَدْ جِئْتُمُونَا كَمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً You have come back to us like we created you the first time around. What is the reference here? Like we created you the first time around. A number of interpretations. Of the interpretations is that this is not the first time we are standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, we have stood in front of Allah before this point in time. But at that point in time, we didn't have physical bodies. We only had our souls. When was that? 
Go back to our lectures that I gave many, many, many months ago uh, about the souls, uh, the barzakh. If you go from last year, subhanAllah, it looks like so many decades ago because of what is happening with the virus issue. But alhamdulillah, it's actually been less than six, seven months ago. I was giving the series about the barzakh. And I talked about the soul. And I talked about the origins and beginnings of the soul. And I mentioned the issue of the mithaq and the issue of the extraction of the soul and the creation of the soul. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran very explicitly that وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ As the Prophet ﷺ explained this verse, all of the souls were gathered in front of Allah, and Allah spoke to all of them. فَكَلَّمَهُمْ قُبُلًا Allah spoke to them directly, and Allah asked them, أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ Am I not your Lord? So that happened when? It happened at the beginning of the creation. When Allah created the creation, i.e. The, cre the creation, the souls. All of our souls were created simultaneously at one point in time, other than the soul of Adam and Hawa that was created before us. First, our parents were created. Then at one point in time, specifically one point in time, all of the children of Adam, from the time of Adam's children up until the day of judgment, their souls were simultaneously created. Then what's gonna happen on the day of judgment? All of the souls are resurrected. So Allah says, وَعُرِضُوا عَلَى رَبِّكَ صَفًّا لَقَدْ جِئْتُمُونَا كَمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً just like we did it once before, you have come back to us once again. SubhanAllah, in the twinkling of an eye, from the beginning of the creation to the end of the creation, and the same things are there. That's one interpretation. The other interpretation is that you have come back to us the way we created you, meaning you have nothing other than the what we gave you. You have no clothes, no money, no status, no rank, nothing. You are, as the hadith says, naked, barefoot, and uncircumcised. Literally, the way you were born, that is the way you come back. And both of these interpretations are valid. So, Surah Al-Kahf as well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَعُرِضُوا عَلَى رَبِّكُ We're talking about the ard or the display. And then uh, the other verse in the Quran that mentions ard is Surah al haq Verse 18. On that day, all of you shall be displayed. On that day, the day of judgment. You shall all be displayed in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing that you want to hide can ever be hidden. No, nothing is hidden. Nothing that you wanted to hide, nothing is going to be remaining hidden on that day. So all of these three verses, they mention the notion of ard, or to be more precise, urid. And urid, as we said, means you shall be displayed. So even whether you want it or not, you shall be displayed. And this display is for the entire creation. That is not the only evidence for being displayed. There's another series of verses with another verb, which also dis uh, uh, indicates that all of us will be displayed in front of Allah. And the other word that is used in the Quran is baraza. Baraza and bariz, barizun. And the word baraza means uh, to show without any hindrance, without any veil. So baraza means it's out in the open. Baraza means nothing is covering you. There's no shade, there's no building. So when we say that somebody is bariz, we mean that they are clear and apparent. There's nothing blocking them. So this is another term that is used in the Quran. And again, this is multiple times in the Quran. So for example, we have uh, in uh, Surat, uh, in Surat uh, Ibrahim, in Surat Ibrahim, uh, verse 21, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا And all of them are shown in front of Allah. بَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا All of them, no exception. Every single creation of Allah وَبَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا And this buruz, how long will it last? We do not know. How many eons or centuries or thousands of years? We do not know. However, we can, we can deduce from the generality of other texts that for the believers, this will be zoomed on. For the believers, it's gonna be a, a moment of honor and pleasure. And for the opposite, it is going to be a moment of dishonor and terror. So, وَبَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا 
all of them will be displayed to Allah. فَقَالَ الضُّعَفَاءُ لِلَّذِينَ اسْتَكْبَرُوا Those who were weak and oppressed, those who were following the, the, the sheep, following the leaders, they would say to those who they were following, the, the, the arrogant people, إِنَّ كُنَّ لَكُمْ تَبْعَى We only obeyed you. You told us to worship these false gods. You told us to kill and to plunder and to whatnot. So for example, uh, you know, um, let's say, people that obeyed orders to kill others, you know, the military that's going and plundering and whatnot. They will say to their leaders, it's not our fault. You told us to go kill these innocent people. We killed them. So well, yeah, the, the weak will say, the weak here meaning those that, that followed orders, those that followed their leaders. They would say to the leaders, Inna kunna lakum taba'a. We only followed you. فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُغْنُونَ عَنَّا مِنْ عَذَابِ اللَّهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Are you now going to take your share of the punishment? Are you going to help us and defend that, hey, these guys, they just followed our orders. Are you going to become the more guilty party because we were only following? And of course, as you know, uh, they will say, it's not our fault, you only followed us. Uh, we're all in this uh, together. And uh, they will, they're not going to take their share of the uh, blame. And another verse, Surah Ibrahim, verse 48. Uh, يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ وَبَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَارِ On that day, the day that the earth shall be substituted for another earth, and the skies shall be substituted for other skies. We talked about this notion of the earth being substituted. We talked about the notion of the day of judgment being in a realm and in a paradigm we cannot understand. And so Allah is saying on that day when all of the earths and the skies shall be substituted, what's gonna happen? وَبَرَزُوا Once again this verb here. وَبَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَّارِ all of them are going to be shown in front of Allah, the wahid, the one, the single. Everybody else is, is in front of Allah and the wahid, the one, is the one who will look upon them. Al-wahid and al-qahar, the one who overpowers and the one who uh, conquers. And in Surah uh, Ghafir verse 16, once again the same names of Allah come, Surah Ghafir verse 16, يَوْمَهُمْ barizun. On that day, all of them shall be displayed without any protection. There will be nothing to conceal them. There's not going to be a canopy or a tree or a building. All of them will be light, laying out flat. All of them will be standing in rows, right? يَوْمَهُمْ barizun. On that day, they will be in front of Allah displayed. لا يخفى على الله منهم شيء. Nothing from them will be hidden uh, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will know everything. And then Allah will say, لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ To whom does the kingdom belong? To whom does all of this belong? Then Allah will answer, لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَّارِ to Allah, the Wahid and the Qahar. So this is Surah Ghafir verse uh, 16. And of course in Surah Al-Kahf as well, we have the same notion of uh, Baraza. وَتَرَ الْأَرْضَ بَارِزَةً وَحَشَرْنَاهُمْ فَلَمْ نُغَادِرْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا That even though in this verse the word Bariza applies to the earth, but right after that uh, Allah says وَحَشَرْنَاهُمْ So on that day the earth is going to be clear, no veil. The earth is not going to be covered. Then Allah says, وَحَشَرْنَاهُمْ وَلَمْ فَلَمْ نُغَادِرْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا Not a single person is left when we gather all of them. So even though in Surah Al-Kahf, uh, the verb uh, or the noun bariz doesn't apply to people, still it comes right before the people. So it is as if Allah is saying that there is nothing that is going to cover mankind. All of mankind will be in front of me, displayed and shown to me. So this is very clear from the Qur'an that Mankind will be urid, will be shown, showcased, and baraza, and bariz, that they are going to be displayed without any protection between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the hadith in Sahih Muslim as well, we have this notion uh, in the hadith of Jarir ibn Abdullah ibn al-Bajali radiallahu ta'ala an, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, hadith is in Sahih Muslim, so it's authentic, أَمَا إِنَّكُمْ تُعْرَضُونَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ Verily, and he's speaking to the Sahaba here, right? So remember, the, the, um, the ard or the buruz 
It's not just for the kafir or for the Muslim, it is for the entire creation without any exception. Here, the Prophet Sallallahu is speaking to the Sahaba and he says to them, Ama, and Ama here it, it basically means you should know or pay attention to the fact or I'm emphasizing to you. So he's making it very clear. You should know and realize that all of you will be displayed in front of your Lord. And you will see him as you are seeing this full moon. And he pointed to the full moon that was there in the middle of the month. Now, this shows us. Remember in our last week, we talked about uh, the coming of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the seeing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, today I'm talking about the display. They are in fact the same thing, that when Allah azza wa jal comes down and when Allah azza wa jal will come with the angels, that will be this display of mankind. Mankind shall be displayed in front of Allah and all of the believers will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like as the Prophet said, you see the moon in the middle of the month when there's no clouds. It's a clear cloud. Do you have any problem seeing the moon? No, Ya Rasulullah. So in the same manner, what is being compared, Audhu Billah is not the moon to Allah. What is being compared is how the Sahaba see the moon versus how they're gonna see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, verily in the same manner, just like you see the moon, you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the notion of being displayed in front of Allah is something that is very, very clear in the Quran and in the uh, Sunnah. How many times shall uh, this display um, uh, take place? Well, there is one tradition that actually mentions that it's going to occur more than once. The Quran does not mention quantity. There's one hadith that does mention the number of times. And let's look at that hadith directly. And uh, it's one of my goals, by the way, as well, during all of my lectures uh, to increase our general awareness and knowledge about not just the specific topic but as you're all aware I go into various tangents here and there and you know it's really not just done because I don't know how to uh, preach without going into a tangent that's definitely also true I'm guilty of that but also there is a hidden reason and that is to increase our awareness about other tangential topics so for example so many times I'll talk about the, a book of hadith I'll talk about a principle of fiqh a principle of usul al-fiqh I'll talk about some theological rule so that inshallah just by listening to these lectures, our overall uh, uh, literacy, if you like, our overall cultural awareness about our religion uh, increases. That is also one of my goals. And so uh, instead of just quoting the hadith once in a while, I like to bring the book and, and talk to you a little bit about it. And so this hadith actually is found in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. And uh, I have mentioned this before, that the Musnad of Imam Ahmad is the largest existent book of hadith. There is no book of hadith that is larger than the Mustad of Imam Ahmad. And in the current edition uh, that was edited by the great scholar from Syria, Shu'ib al-Arna'ut, uh, the current edition published by Mu'asat al-Risala, it has 50 volumes of this book. One book in 50 volumes. And that's because they did a very thorough job of going into a lot of footnotes and whatnot. And um, uh, this book is considered to be one of the, lar sorry, the largest existent. There might have been one or two that are non-existent, but the largest existent uh, collection of hadith in one book is the Musnad of the great Imam, the great scholar Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who died 241 Hijra. 241 Hijra. He was also, by the way, the last of the four great Imams to die. Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi'i, they all passed away before uh, 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 Imam Ahmad. May Allah's mercy be on all of them. The first of them was Abu Hanifa, who died 150. Then it was Imam Malik, who died 179. Then it was Imam Shafi'i, who died 204. And then it was Imam uh, uh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who died 241 Hijra. And each one of them is basically one generation away from the uh, other one. And Imam Ahmad uh, was also not only a scholar of fiqh, he was also a scholar of hadith, and he was also a scholar of theology. And he left uh, many, many uh, students who took on his legacy after him. And his greatest book was, of course, the Musnad of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And uh, Imam Ahmad was also the teacher of Imam al-Bukhari. So Imam Ahmad's generation was also the generation that the next batch, the most famous batch of the traditionalist scholars, the 
the scholars of the traditions, the scholars of hadith. So the six famous authors the, of hadith, they came one generation and a generation and a half after Imam Ahmad. So Imam, but Imam Ahmad was also one of the famous scholars of hadith. So again, hadith has been compiled from the beginning of time, even the Sahaba had little treatises, but the famous books were written uh, in the generation right after Imam Ahmad. Before that generation, Imam Malik wrote a book called Muatta, we're all aware of it. It is one of the first, if not the first book written that was meant to be uh, publicized. And uh, Imam Ahmad wrote his Musnad, and then Bukhari comes and dies 256. Imam Ahmad's 241, Bukhari is 256, and he's considered to be one generation less than because Imam Ahmad died uh, uh, a, a relatively older man. No, now um, Imam Ahmad's Musnad, uh, there's a beautiful hadith that was relevant to us, and that is in volume uh, 32, volume 32, page 486. And one of the things about the Musnad Imam Ahmad, which also makes it a bit difficult to read, to be honest, um, Imam Ahmad's Musnad, the reason why it's called Musnad is that it is uh, arranged not according to topics. Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Nisa'id, Imajah, Muatta, Imam Malik, they're according to topics. You can look up the book of Salah, you can look up the book of Tafsir, you can look up the book of the signs of the Day of Judgment, you, you can look up the book of the heart softeners, and you will find all of the ahadith that they wanted you to know about that one topic arranged topically, according to topics. Imam Ahmad did not want to write a book based upon topics. Imam Ahmad wanted to write an encyclopedia based upon the narrator of the hadith. So he's going to have all of the narrations of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq in one section, then Umar al-Khattab, the next section, then Uthman, then Ali radiallahu anhu ajma'in, and so on and so forth. So that's why it is called a musnad, because a musnad means a book of hadith that is arranged not according to topics, but according to the Sahaba themselves. And and in the Musnad of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, one of the great uh, scholars of the, uh, one of the great uh, narrators of hadith of the Sahaba, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, we come across hadith number 19,715. So this is very deep into the book. Uh, again, it's volume 32. So again, it's one of the, the later volumes. And Imam Ahmad says, Waqi' narrated to me that Ali ibn Ali ibn Rifa' narrated to me that Al-Hassan al-Basri narrated to me that Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu said, Qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the hadith. Uh, all, the, all of that was a tangent to inshallah benefit us about some, some of the issues of hadith. And we're not done by the way. There's going to be other benefits right now with it. Again, just FYI. يُعْرَضُ النَّاسُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ ثَلَاثَ عَرَضَاتِ فَأَمَّا عَرْضَتَانِ فَجِدَالٌ وَمَعَاذِيرٌ وَأَمَّا الثَّالِثَةُ فَعِنْدَ ذَلِكَ تَطِيرُ الصُّحُفُ فِي الْأَيْدِي فَآخِذٌ بِيَمِينِهِ وَآخِذٌ بِشِمَالِهِ So this hadith, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, يُعْرَضُ النَّاسُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ ثَلَاثَ عَرَضَاتِ People will be displayed on the Day of Judgment Three displays. This is a very explicit hadith. People will be displayed three times. As for the first two, fajidalun wa ma'adhir. It will be defenses and excuses. So you will be challenged, you will have a time to defend yourself. You will be presented with your accusations, and then you will have a chance to defend yourself, right? And then as for the third, that will be the time, تَطِيرُ الصُّحُفُ فِي الْأَيْدِي That the scrolls will then be given, i.e. the result will be handed back. So some people will hold with the right hand, may Allah make us amongst them, and others will hold with the left hand. We seek refuge from being amongst them. Now, the issue of the scrolls and the issue of right and left hand, we will get to that inshallah in two or three lessons whenever we get there and that is the results as the Quran explicitly mentions uh, These are explicit in the Quran Some people will get the results in the right hand Some will get them in the left hand and out of shame will put them behind their back That we're going to come to This hadith explicitly mentions there shall be three times that we're going to have this dialogue with Allah and Allah Azza wa Jal will speak directly to us and there will be the three uh, the, the three uh, aradat. Now this seems to be, it's, it's, it solves the problem that it's very clear that there are three. Uh, and this hadith by the way, uh, is also found the same with a similar chain uh, in a Tirmidhi, but not as complete of a wording. So I chose Muslim Imam Ahmad's one because it is uh, more details in the wording. However, Small technical issue here, and again, j 
just FYI, so that we benefit insha'Allah ta'ala. Uh, we have over here the famous Tabi'i, Al-Hassan uh, Al-Basri. And Hassan Al-Basri was perhaps one of the most, no, not, he, he really, it, it, you can say not even perhaps, he was one of the most famous scholars of the students of the Sahaba generation. And he died 110 Hijrah. And he is considered to be one of the most ascetic worshippers, one of the greatest scholars, a narrator of hadith, a scholar of tafsir, a great alim, and one of the people who narrated so many a hadith from uh, the previous generation. However, there is an issue with Al-Hassan Al-Basri uh, which doesn't uh, impugn his integrity. It's just that in his time frame, the concept of narrating sources wasn't quite fully developed. I.e., Al-Hassan Al-Basri is well known for dropping sources. And in Arabic, this is called uh, Tadlis. And Tadlis is of different types. And of the types of Tadlis is that, for example, if you heard from somebody who heard from somebody else, and then you just drop the intermediary, and you say, oh, so-and-so said, and you drop the intermediary who told you. Well, technically, you know, you are only narrating what has been told to you, and that's technically not a lie. But when you're talking about hadith narrations, you have to be very specific where you get it from. And later scholars of hadith really tightened this, this, this knot over here. They said you have to be very, you know, and of course, they, they had every right to do that. But Al-Hassan al-Basri is... 100 Hijrah, right? He's alive and flourishing, you know, 90, 100, he died 110 Hijrah. So he's at a very early time frame. And in his time frame, it was a little bit more lax that, you know, and especially because Al-Hassan al-Basri met some of the Sahaba, and he met many of the senior most level of the Sahaba. So Hassan al-Basri, even though he met some of the Sahaba, still he is not of the generation that is directly studying with the big major Sahaba. He did not meet Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he did not narrate from Umar ibn Khattab and others, so he did not get to that generation of the uh, Sahaba. Uh, and in fact, he didn't even meet uh, many of the senior Sahaba. He only met some of those Sahaba who lived a much, much longer life. And of the Sahaba he did not meet is Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. And here, Al-Hassan al-Basri is saying, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari said, even though Hassan al-Basri did not meet Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Why does he have the right to say this? Well, he's simply narrating to you what he has heard from his own teachers. And we don't know who those teachers are. And so later scholars of hadith say, you know what, this is a missing link over here. And uh, the technical term, this is called the Marasil of Al-Hassan al-Basri. There's a very famous chapter in every single advanced book of the sciences of hadith. And there are so many, uh, there's in fact one of my teachers, he wrote a dissertation about the Marasil of Hassan al-Basri and th that dissertation is over a thousand pages, I kid you not, over a thousand pages, which is a detailed analysis of the uh, narrations of Al-Hassan al-Basri and the fact that he's doing a type of tadlis and marasi. So anyway, I mean, this is all stuff that I just want you to be aware of, that the sciences of hadith is a very well-developed science. It's not just something that is random out there. And these types of narrations, uh, we have no problem narrating them as long as we explain that, hey, you know what, guys, you should be aware that this narration has a very slight weakness to it. It is really one of the most slightest weaknesses possible, and that is when you have something like the Marasil of Al-Hassan al-Basri. Nonetheless, technically speaking, this narration is not Hassan or Sahih, and our theology is only based on authentic narration. So, these types of hadith, we may narrate them in light of the fact that the Quran is very explicit about the Ard, the other hadith in Sahih Muslim is very ex explicit, the hadith of Jarir ibn Abdullah, where our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَمَا إِنَّكُمْ تُعْرَضُونَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ So the concept of Ard, the concept of Allah seeing us and speaking with us is something that is very clear in the Quran and in the Sunnah. In this hadith of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, we are getting a detail, and that is three times. And not only that, but very interesting, what's gonna happen each of those three times? The first time you are presented with your charges, you're presented with your accusations. The second time you have the opportunity to defend. Do you have any excuse? What are you gonna say about this? And then the third time shall be the result. And 
beautiful narration, we should simply add the caveat, well, we don't know if it's actually going to happen. It's not nothing wrong to narrate it, it's nothing wrong to explain, but we should not be certain about this. In the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So this is the concept of ard, and it is mentioned in the Quran and in the Sunnah. There are other evidences as well that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to see um, uh, all of us or meet all of us. And another genre of evidences deals with another term, and that is the term liqa. And liqa has a more specific connotation. Liqa means a private meeting, or liqa means a meeting face to face. Mulaqa is to meet face to face. And liqa means that you are seeing one another. And uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the term uh, in the Quran, uh, for example, in the context of two armies facing one another, okay? Two armies that are seeing one another and you see them. Allah mentions this as uh, liqa. And the concept of Allah having liqa with all of us is something that once again, the Quran has almost a dozen verses, as does the hadith. So for example, in Surah Al-An'am, verse 94, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ جِئْتُمُونَ فُرَادَ كَمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً that you have come to us individually. So this is now uh, another concept, Jitu Muna, you have come to us uh, individually. You're coming to us, Furada, one by one. So each one of us will be in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? وَلَقَدْ جِئْتُ مُنَا فُرَادَ Furada means one by one. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, الَّذِينَ يَظُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُوا رَبِّهِمْ The believers are those who, they are certain that they're going to meet their Lord, the mulaqa, right? So liqa is a meeting, an interview. It's a one-on-one. -on -one. In the Quran, man kana yarju liqa rabbihi, whoever is desiring to meet his Lord, liqa rabbihi, you know that you're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Quran as well, wattaqu allaha wa'lamu annakum mulaquh. Fear Allah and be certain that you're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is a meeting. And in Surah Al-Inshiqaq, يَا أَيُّوَ الْإِنسَانُ إِنَّكَ كَادِحٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ كَدْحًا فَمُلَاقِيهِ O mankind, you are laboring very intensely towards your Lord. أَيَّا أَيُّوَ الْإِنسَانُ That you are laboring, كَدْحًا, which means very intensely, you are continually doing your deeds, whether they're good or they're bad, فَمُلَاقِيهِ And you are going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, very clearly in the Quran, once again, we have this notion of a private meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's also a very, very beautiful hadith um, uh, narrated by Ibn Abbas radiallahu We'll talk about it in the next lesson, and that is called the hadith of Allah's covering or Allah's sitr, that Allah will cover up his servant, and Allah will speak to him one on one. Laysa baynahu wa baynahu tarjuman. There shall not be any interpreter between him and between, meaning the person, and between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, once again, a very explicit affirmation of a mulaqa, of a meeting. Now, question Does this individual meeting, this mulaqa, does this one on one, take place at the very beginning of the buruz, at the very beginning of the uridu, or is that going to take place later on? Response, we do not know. We do not know. The texts do not indicate. Is it going to be right then and there, or is it going to be later on? And so I will go over all the evidences, and as I'll mention to you one more time before um, conc uh, concluding today's lecture, that uh, really the the the... the uh, chronology of events on the Day of Judgment, the chronology of events on the Day of Judgment, it is something that is not 100% known for multiple reasons. And so, will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak to in, us individually at the very beginning when He comes? Or will that be delayed for a later time? We do not know. And it is possible that it will be immediate and it is possible that it will be done afterwards. And by the way, if somebody were to say, how 
can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak to all of us individually when we are in the billions, when there are hundreds of millions of people? If somebody were to ask this question, that how can Allah have mulaqa with every single human being? And how can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala present the charges and then we defend ourselves and then we are given our hisab? All of us happening on the day of judgment, you know, when we go to the court of law, even for a trivial issue, you have to wait in line for three, four, five hours until the judge has the time to see you. What is going to happen when there are billions of people? How can Allah Azza wa Jal speak to all of us simultaneously? You are not the first to ask this question. Somebody asked the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Habr al-Ummah and the Tarjuman of the Quran, the chief uh, yani Shaykh of this Ummah basically is called the Habr, is the one full of wisdom of this Ummah. And the Tarjuman or the Mufassir of the Quran, that is Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Somebody asked Ibn Abbas, Oh Ibn Abbas, how will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak to all of us individually simultaneously? How is that going to happen? You know what Ibn Abbas said? Subhanallah. He said, the same way how Allah provides all of them the rizq simultaneously. Subhanallah. All of us, Allah is providing us our rizq, taking care of us like this. Why is it surprising that on the day of judgment, Allah will speak to all of us individually? So the issue of ard and buruz, barizun and mulaqa is again very clear and also we have uh, other evidences as well. And again, I'm just going over all of these so that inshallah we have a comprehensive understanding of all of these verses in the Quran. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, in the Quran, uh, uh, in Surah, uh, surah An-Nur, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَعْمَالُهُمْ كَسَرَابٍ بِقِيعَةٍ يَحْسَبُهُ الظَّمْآنُ مَاءً حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَهُ لَمْ يَجِدْهُ شَيْئًا وَوَجَدَ اللَّهَ عِنْدَهُ فَوَفَّاهُ حِسَابًا وَاللَّهُ سَرِيعُ الْحِسَابًا Another uh, verse that in indicates the meeting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, those who don't believe in Allah, those who are uh, uh, kuffar, their good deeds are like mirages in the desert. Mirages in an empty land. When you look at it, you think it is water. And when you rush to it thinking it is water, you're not going to find anything. The meaning here, you think you have good deeds and you will rush to go find your good deeds on the day of judgment. But what if you haven't done good deeds? What if you lived your whole life and wasted your life without doing any good deeds? You're gonna rush to look for your good deeds. Hatta idha ja'ahu. When you get to the destination that you're thinking your good deeds might be there, lam yajidhu shay'a. He's not gonna find anything. Just like the one lost in the desert sees the mirage, rushes to the mirage, and finds nothing over there. And then Allah says, Wa wajadallaha indahu. Rather than finding your illusory good deeds, rather than finding this illusion and mirage, what will you find? عِنْدَهُ He shall find Allah in front of him. He shall find Allah right there. فَوَفَّاهُ حِسَابًا And Allah will then deal with his judgment and make the hisab or the accounting of him right then and there. وَاللَّهُ سَرِيعُ الْحِسَابِ And how fast is Allah in hisab. So this verse is also very, very explicit. Also, many other verses in the Quran, وَقِفُوهُمْ Cause them to stop. So stop them right then and there. So another point, they're being stopped. إِنَّهُمْ مَسْؤُولُونَ They're going to be asked about what they have done. And for example, all of the verses that you will return to Allah, you shall meet Allah. Uh, إِنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الرُّجْعَىٰ That verily the ruj'a and the ruj'a is the return back to, is going to be to Allah. So anyway, all of these verses, and there are literally over 50 of them. I summarized for you, I think in today's lecture, around 20, 25, but there are around double this number. All of them clearly indicate that the creation en masse shall be displayed in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then that each and every one of us shall have a private meeting with Allah, either immediately or after a while, but that is also going to happen. Now, there is another issue here before uh, we open up the floor for Q&A. And by the way, feel, or those of you that are watching live, uh, feel free to type in your questions and answers. If you're watching this on YouTube later on, then there's no time for the live Q&A. But um, one of the, the disputes that happened is the issue of in this ard and in this buruz, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes 
and when the believers will see Allah, and this will be the first time they will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first time, and this isn't the only time by the way, the believers will see Allah multiple times. They will see Him on the day of judgment, and then they shall see Him again in Jannah. May Allah make us amongst those people. And the seeing of the day of judgment is not the same as the seeing of, judgment, of Jannah. And the seeing of the day of judgment is indeed a blessing, and it is indeed a, 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 a ni'mah, and a reward, and a gift. But the seeing of Jannah is a much higher blessing. How so? Our minds do not understand. That's beyond our comprehension. But there is nothing in Jannah that is higher than the blessing of gazing upon the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that blessing is restricted to the people of Jannah after they enter Jannah. As for Qiyamah, it is going to be a glimpse and it is going to be a blessing. And it is indeed something that we strive and aim for, but it should not be compared to the gaze that will happen inside of Qiyamah, sorry, inside of Jannah after the entering of Jannah. So the issue of seeing Allah Azza wa Jal is again very clear. And again, this is very explicit in the Quran. I mentioned this last week. On that day, faces will be bright looking at their Lord. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you shall see your Lord on the day of judgment as you see this moon. So again, the Quran and Sunnah very clear that we will see Allah on the Day of Judgment. Okay, question, next issue. Who will see Allah? The believers only or all of mankind, including those who rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, this issue is one that there is no clear-cut text on. There is nothing that is definitive that will those who rejected Allah also see Allah on the Day of Judgment by unanimous consensus and very clear that once the believers enter Jannah, that blessing of seeing Allah, which is the highest blessing, that is only going to be given to the righteous believers who enter Jannah. But the question is, on the day of judgment, will the kafir see Allah or not? Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, uh, was asked about this, uh, and he wrote an entire treatise, and subhanAllah, what an amazing mind. Most of his treatises, most of his pamphlets, most of his books and booklets were responses to fatawa that he would get from across the Muslim world. And he would just sit down and typically after Dhuhr and between Asr or between Dhuhr and Maghrib, he would write from his head, yani just all of this gushing out. And um, he wrote around 15, 20 pages of a question that came to him from the people of Bahrain. And this is in his famous compilation. He didn't compile it, a, a, modern, a modern scholar uh, around 50 years ago, Sheikh Al Qasimi. He traveled the Muslim world and he collected all the treatises that he could find of Ibn Taymiyyah and he put them under a massive compilation, 30 plus volumes called Majmu' Fatawa Shaykh Al Islam. That the comprehensive treatises and fatawa of Shaykh Al Islam. This is not one book that Shaykh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah authored, it is a compilation of uh, a scholar around 50 years ago, and then his uh, son helped him as well in that regard. And it is not a comprehensive uh, compilation because he did not manage to compile all the treatises. And there are other issues about this that it does require more um, uh, manuscripts and whatnot, but, but, but uh, it is a very good starting point to get the treatises of Ibn Taymiyyah. And in one of those treatises, in volume six, page 485, uh, the treatise occurs, Risala ila ahli Bahrain the treaties of the response to the people of Bahrain. And the people of Bahrain wrote Ibn Taymiyyah a letter. And they said to him that in our community, people have differed over this issue of whether the kafir will see Allah on the day of judgment or not. And we have begun fighting amongst ourselves. And it has led to harsh words and, you know, I mean, I'm paraphrasing with boycotts and this and that and call accusations of be people being deviants. And maybe even we're close to reaching physical fists, fist fighting over this issue. And so 
Shaykh al-Islam wrote to them from the top of his head this treatise. You can read this and subhanAllah, the amount of evidences that would come forth. It's as if Ibn Taymiyyah is like a mount, like a, a river just gushing forth statements from the Sahaba, tabi'un, tabi'un, tabi'un. And the question was what? Does the kafir see Allah on the Day of Judgment or not? And Ibn Taymiyyah in his typical style, he mentioned that this is a controversy that was unknown in the time of the Sahaba and tabi'un. It came later on only 300 years ago, Ibn Taymiyyah is writing around 720 Hijrah, this treaty, 715 Hijrah. So he's saying around uh, three, 400 years ago, this controversy began after the third century of the Hijrah, or the fourth century of the Hijrah. Before this point in time, nobody debated this issue. And then he said, there are opinions uh, on all uh, different sides. And whichever position you follow, this is Ibn Taymiyyah, who is generally viewed as being a very hardcore, a very you know, fundamentalist fanatic. But in reality, if you read his writings, he is not like that. And I've said this many, many times before, that the people who claim to follow Ibn Taymiyyah do Ibn Taymiyyah a great disservice in their attitude and in their, frankly, uh, their, their sectarianism and their fanaticism that is not Ibn Taymiyyah. If you read Ibn Taymiyyah and you actually immerse yourself in the writings of this great scholar, you find that he is far more open-minded and tolerant uh, than many of the people who claim to follow him. And I think that is something that anybody who reads Ibn Taymiyyah comes to this conclusion. And in this own fatwa, you get this response. He says, look, these issues should not cause hatred and animosity. Whichever, whichever position you follow, don't consider the other to be you know, deviated or whatnot. You're all Muslims, you're all people that, you know, you, you, you should not be fighting over these issues. These issues should not cause accusations of heresy or accusations of hatred or, or disunity. You know, let the, every group yani, follow its position with respect to the other positions as well. And then he mentions that there were three opinions about this issue and he himself preferred one of them. This is the whole point. He's saying, look, I like this one, but the other two are also there. And hey, in the end of the day, it's not a big deal. Like if you, the kafir sees Allah or not, why are you guys fighting over this petty issue? Why are you guys breaking the unity of the ummah over an abstract theoretical issue that is of no tangible value to your own communities. And so subhanAllah, this attitude is really what I myself have when I tell you about so many other issues, even though frankly, sometimes, uh, frankly, Ibn Taymiyyah, perhaps in some other areas, he did have a more strict response than maybe I am having right now. And that's fine. Times change. I say to the followers of Ibn Taymiyyah that imagine what Ibn Taymiyyah would have done in our time frame. And it is my goal that I don't think he would have been as harsh as he was against his critics a thousand or seven, eight hundred years ago. And that's my opinion. You have the right to disagree with it. In any case, uh, my point being that he mentions this controversy about the kafir seeing Allah and, or not. And he says there are three opinions. He says the majority position is that the kafir will not see Allah in the ard. Allah will see them. They will not see Allah. Okay, so this is the majority opinion. Allah will see the kafir because Allah will look at all the creation. They will be displayed in front of Allah. And of course, yani Allah sees everything all the time. So nothing is hidden from Allah. But the kafir will not see Allah. And he said this is the position of the majority. And he quotes the famous verse in the Quran, كَلَّا إِنَّهُمْ عَرَّبِّهِمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ لَمَحْجُوبُونَ That verily on that day, there shall be a veil between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says that Imam Malik was also asked that, will the believers see Allah on the Day of Judgment? Imam Malik replied, if the kafir does not see Allah, based upon the verse, there's going to be a hijab, then the whole purpose, therefore, that Imam Malik said, that, sorry, let me rephrase. Imam Malik said, if the believers didn't see Allah, then how is it a punishment when Allah takes a veil between him and the kafir? This is what Imam Malik said. Think about this. Allah is saying in the Quran, there is a hijab or a veil between the kafir and Allah. Imam Malik said, if the believers don't see Allah, why is Allah saying there's a veil between me and the kafir? So the point is that because the kafir is mentioned, there is a veil, therefore the believers, there is no veil. And Imam Shafi'i was famously uh, asked about this verse. He recited this verse and he said, when Allah has taken a veil for the kafir, this shows that his chosen servants shall have no veil and they shall see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first position, the kafir will never see Allah and it is not going to be something given to them. The second position, 
is that the kafir will see Allah, but not the seeing of the mu'min. And that the kafir will see Allah, but it will be a seeing of terror and fear, not a seeing of comfort and izzah. And so Allah will display himself to the believers in a manner that will give them comfort, in a manner that will give them hope, in a manner that will increase their iman. And as for the kafir, their seeing of Allah will only increase them in terror and in fright, just like a criminal is brought forth in front of the judge and the criminal knows he's guilty and the criminal knows he's going to be sentenced and the judge or the ruler or whatever when the criminal is brought in front of, that is not an honor, it is a dishonor and the person is terrified. al-a'la To Allah belongs the highest example. And so Ibn Taymiyyah says a second position is that the kafir will see Allah, but not the seeing of the believer. And why? how, how do we know this? The generalities of the verses that all of you will see him and that there is no single person except that Allah will speak to him. There's no intermediary between them. So the generality of the Quran and Sunnah might seem to indicate as well that the kafir will see Allah. And then the third position Ibn Taymiyyah says is that the kafir will not see Allah, but the mu'min and the munafiq, the hypocrite, and some of the Ahli Kitab, the Ahli Kitab are the highest category and, uh, of non-Muslims, and they have some perks and privileges, and especially the righteous amongst them, as Allah praises in the Quran, that there are some of the Ahli Kitab, when they listen to the Quran, their eyes are crying out of love and fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and uh, others are praised in the Quran in other manners, and especially those of the Ahli Kitab, especially those who did not hear of Islam and they lived righteous lives. So we hope good for them and we leave their affair to Allah on the Day of Judgment. Um, Ibn Taymiyyah said that the third opinion, the mu'min, the munafiq, and some of the Ahli Kitab, he does not say who, but we can assume what he means, the righteous of the Ahli Kitab. They shall see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then the munafiq in particular, that will be taken away, that privilege will be taken away and the munafiq will then end up in Jahannam. And he bases this on a hadith that we're going to come to inshallah in our uh, future uh, lesson inshallah, maybe next week or the week after next week. So to conclude and then open up some time for Q&A, uh, to conclude today's lesson. Today we continued from the issue of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, coming down uh, and uh, the people being displayed. And I mentioned uh, 30 evidences from the Quran, around 30 evidences from the Quran and Sunnah that mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, uh, or the people will be displayed in front of Allah and that Allah will meet the people. And I said that the Quran affirms even individual meeting, mulaqa. And then we said we don't know whether that meeting will occur at the very beginning and that immediately will jump into the Day of Judgment or there will be a prolonged time after this. And in all likelihood, actually, uh, there will be different types of Day of Judgments for different peoples, i.e. for the believer, the Day of Judgment will be a very different experience than for the weak believer. The strong believer will have a different experience than the weak believer, and then the kafir, and then will have a different experience, and then the worst of the worst, those who lied against Allah, and those who did other crimes that are even worse, they will have even a different experience on the Day of uh, Judgment. And then we said the issue of the non-Muslim seeing Allah, uh, this is an issue of controversy, and in the end of the day, there's no, uh, there's no point really in, in, in in, in discussing the, the or there's no uh, uh, benefit in really arguing for too long, as Ibn Taymiyyah said. Yeah, and the Quran is is you can argue both ways. Even though he himself was sympathetic to the first opinion, which is that only the believers will see Allah, and those who rejected Allah will not uh, see Him on the day of judgment. So we now open the floor for uh, some Q and A, insha Allah Taala, and then we call it uh, our lesson. Um, so, question is that um, will we recognize the people around us? Definitely, yes, we will recognize the people. We will know the people around us. And in fact, we shall be resurrected with our own groups. Each ummah will be in its own. And then each one of us will see the people whom we know. And I already mentioned this a few lessons ago, that on the day of uh, judgment, we will be able to see every person whom we knew in this world. We'll be able to 
how Allah knows best. But if we want to see someone, we will see them and all of the crowd, it is as if they will disappear and we can have our gaze on that one person and they will have their gaze on us. That will be a different time frame, a different paradigm, a different, uh, completely different day. No one will be able to hide from another even if they try. They're gonna run away. They're gonna try to run away, but still we will recognize them and we will um, call them. Uh, question over here is that, will we receive uh, physical books? What do you mean by physical? We will receive books, we will receive scrolls. From our perception, we will hold them. Obviously, what is physics and what is chemistry on that day, Allah knows best, but we will receive something that we will hold on to. So they will be tangible in that realm and we will feel them and show them to the people or we seek Allah's refuge, be embarrassed and uh, hide them. Uh, so a uh, question here that if Allah is separate from his creation, how can he come on the day, day of judgment? Wouldn't that make him within the creation? So you see this question from our dear brother or sister is exactly the crux of the matter. This is exactly the crux of the matter. And that is that, how do you understand these phrases? Your Lord will come, your Lord will be seen, you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your Lord will speak, your Lord will يعني, يأتي ربك, يأتي بعض, يأتي ربك, or يأتي ربك, your Lord will come. How do we understand all of this? So as I explained to you in the last lesson, and I'll say it again, the one strand of Islam, which is found very early on, and it is definitely the strand of Imam al-Bukhari himself and Imam Ahmed himself very clearly, and so many of the other early scholars of hadith, and this is called the Athari strand. They basically said, guys, if Allah says so, let's just accept it and don't think about how. It's not something our minds will understand. And they gave a simple example. And that example is, doesn't Allah say in the Quran that He is Al Hay and He is Al Samir and He is Al Basir and He is Alim Al Ghaybi wa Shahada? Do you understand how Allah has Haya? No. So if you don't understand how Allah has Haya, then you also don't understand how Allah sees, you don't understand how Allah hears, you don't understand how Allah will come on the Day of Judgment, neither is your mind qualified to understand, nor has Allah asked you to understand how. Allah has asked you to believe, so simply believe without questioning. And this is called Bal Kafa or Bila Kayf. This is a technical theological term. We believe in all of the attributes without kayf. And this is the methodology of many great scholars, including Imam al-Bukhari, Ibn Khuzayma, uh, including most of the Hanbali scholars. Ibn Taymiyyah strongly defended this, Ibn Qayyim. In our times, you have the Athari school that is upon that. Then as I explained to you, you have another group. Uh, and the first group to begin this was the group that was called the Jahmi and then the Mu'tazila. And then another group came along that adopted some of these, some of these, aspects from the Mu'tazila, and this is people like Abu Mansur al-Maturidi uh, and Abu al-Hasan al-Ash'ari. They took these notions, even though they refuted the Mu'tazila in many areas, in particular Qadr, but they adopted some of these notions that were found uh, amongst them when it came to the Sifat or the attributes of Allah. And this exact point that you are saying, that to say that Allah comes means that He's moving from place to place. It necessitates that He is a body. It necessitates this and that. So this notion of what it necessitates is that strand. And uh, scholars like Al-Baqillani and Al-Bayhaqi and Al-Juwaini and uh, Al-Ghazali and Al-Razi and of all of those yani, ulama of that strand, Al-Iji and Al-Bayjuri, they're all great ulama of the Ash'ari school and then you have Abu Mansur Al-Maturidi and then Al-Taftazani of the Maturidi school and then you have of course Abdul Qad Al-Qadi Abdul Jabbar uh, from the Mu'tazili and then if, I mean again all of this is advanced theology, I don't want to go, I don't want to go there even though I just want all of these names. My point is that, listen, dear Muslims, these issues, they don't really affect the average Muslim of our time anymore. And my humble advice to both strands is to not increase the animosity between two schools who share a lot of ulama. 
between them and who share a lot in common. What they share is much more than what disunites them. And the average Muslim will live and die without ever thinking about these issues unless one of these two strands starts pouring kerosene, starts prodding, starts pushing, starts speaking in a very harsh manner. And we all went through this phase, uh, some of us did at least in the 90s and whatnot, and we saw there was no benefit in this. So my position now is live and let live and leave these discussions to the advanced lectures and advanced theology classes. For now, let's just concentrate on the Quran. Whatever of the two positions you want to follow, I hope that when you read the Quran, your heart feels a sense of awe, a sense of trouble, trembling. In the end of the day, however you interpret it, when you read the phrase, وَجَاءَ رَبُّكَ وَالْمَلَكُ صَفًّا صَفًّا Your heart should be trembling, waiting for that day. When you read the phrase that uh, the believers are those who they know they're going to meet their Lord, مُلَاقُوا رَبِّهِمْ When you read the phrase, وَبَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا All of us will be displayed in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Forget whichever of the two interpretations, let's get to the spirit, let's get to the point of these verses rather than getting into the advanced nitty gritty and what this and the implications of that and what does it necessitate. Look, all of this, it's useful for a certain segment of advanced theology students. And like I said, I teach this and I am well aware and it is my area of expertise, but that's at a level that is academic. Let's not lose sight of the spiritual point of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us this. And of course, one of these two opinions is more correct than the other. They both can't be, you know, they're mutually exclusive, obviously. Yet still I say, let every group teach what it wants to teach in a manner and a language and a methodology in a time and a place that inshallah will not increase the divisions of the ummah. Dear Muslims, especially the two strands here or the three strands here, you guys might be arguing about the attributes of Allah. Your children are arguing about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Put things into perspective and don't get lost and confuse the forest from the trees. You guys might be arguing about very advanced abstract issues, controversies that go back, no exaggeration, no exaggeration, 1,300 years this controversy goes back, 1,300 years, and you are resurrecting it amongst the next generation when the next generation would never ever hear of it unless you bring it up and you teach them what the past said. If you were to be quiet and the other group were to be quiet, guess what? This controversy would be forgotten. Nobody worries about it. We have bigger issues. Our children are leaving Islam. They're doubting Allah's existence. They're doubting the Prophet has to be followed. They're doubting he's a prophet. Let's concentrate on that. And let's leave the advanced discussion to the advanced students. And even amongst the advanced students, let's not preach a hatred and a division. This is what Ibn Taymiyyah himself is arguing when he came to this issue of seeing uh, Allah on the day of judgment for the Kaaba. Look, come together on what you agree upon. And this issue, let it be, and let it not divide the, the unity amongst you. That is what I'm saying to a much bigger issue. Ibn Taymiyyah did not say, I'm not saying he said it to that issue. I'm simply saying the same spirit that he understood for an issue a thousand years ago, 800 years ago, I'm saying Ibn Taymiyyah did not see our time frame and he didn't live in this time frame, nor did he live as a minority in a Western land seeing what's going on. And please, therefore, both of these parties learn from history, learn from what we ourselves learned from 20, 30 years ago, from the 80s, 90s, 2000s. We saw these debates, we saw the ummah break up and whatnot, and we realized this is not healthy. I went into way much, I should have, time is uh, subhanAllah, definitely later than it should be. I was supposed to finish 10 minutes ago. Inshallah ta'ala, uh, we'll continue bi ta'ala next uh, Wednesday and we'll move on to the next issue, which is going to be the uh, actual hisab, the actual judgment and the issue of the mizan and the scrolls and all of this. That will be inshallah ta'ala in our uh, next uh, Wednesday's lesson. Until then, jazakumullahu khayran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect me and you from all fitan, the clear and the apparent and the hidden. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only take our souls when He is pleased with us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow our best days to be our last days and the best day of our life 
the day that we meet him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow the kalima of la ilaha illallah to be the last phrase we ever say in this world. Allahumma tawaffana muslimin. Allahumma tawaffana wa anta radin anna. Allahumma tawaffana wa anta radin anna. Wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala bi muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. إن المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما